Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Alfonso Acosta. I'm, I'm, I'm a software engineer at, at WeaveWorks. And today I'm going to be talking about high performance Linux monitoring with eBPF. But before I start, I would like to get a feeling about what kind of audience I'm, I'm, I'm going to be delivering my talk to. So who knows what uh, TCP dump is? <laughs> Raise your hands. Everyone, just like I expected. Who knows what BPF is? Almost everyone. Oh, we have a high level here. Who knows how to code in C? Everyone as well. OK, great. And who knew uh, what WeaveWorks is before coming here today? OK. <laughs> All right. So uh, as I said, I'm uh, Alfonso Acosta. I'm a software engineer at WaveWorks. And we're a startup company whose ultimate goal is to simplify the development and operation of microservice-oriented applications, which are typically containerized. And one, we, we have a software-as-a-service product called WaveCloud. And among uh, other services and or cloud offering, we offer something called WaveScope which, uh, among other things, that does visualization of uh, communication between containers, networking communication. So in order to do that, we need to track TCP connections in real time. So in this talk, I'm going to be uh, introducing BPF, uh, or what we call today classic BPF. Um, then I'm going to expand on eBPF and what that brings to us, in particular, on our, our WeaveWorks use case. And finally, I'm going to talk about how we've incorporated eBPF in uh, WaveScope in order to do high-performance monitoring of TCP connections. Uh, even if it's a short talk, uh, I would like this to be interactive. So please, if at any point in time you have a question, ask it right away. Uh, they'll be handing over a microphone, OK? So to start with, I'm going to be asking you a question. Uh, can anybody tell me what this does? Everybody has used TCP dump, right? So what, what does it do? OK, it dumps HTTP traffic. And uh, furthermore, how, uh, can you tell me how this works on Linux? Anybody can tell me how this works? Yeah. Well, you try to traffic, and then you try to... Can, you t can you speak to the microphone, please? Well, I should try to match traffic on whether or not it's HTTP, and then you look at the destination port, and you check whether or not it's All right. But, uh, yeah, so somebody's going to elaborate uh, on that. I'll give you the details. What it is, uh, TCP dump opens an AF packet socket, get it raw data. <laughs> Then it pushes down a BPF program, which is a small program that says, look at offset 10 and look for the TCP protocol number and then go to the other offset. And OK, cool. Yeah, that's how it works. So he knows all the details. Basically, um, uh, how this works is instead of forwarding every single packet from kernel space to user space and then based on, on the packet you filter on user space, it, it, it happens on, on, on the kernel. And we do that through something called B BPF. Uh, otherwise, we it would be super inefficient because you would need to forward every single TCP packet to user space and filter it there. So um, in 1992, uh, the Berkeley, uh, software distribution, Unix BSD, introduced something on a paper which is really, really interesting, and I encourage you to read. They introduced something called Berkeley Packet Filter. And its goal is to filter packets at the, at the, in the kernel based on a virtual machine, on a program, a bytecode program executed by a virtual machine, which runs on every, every packet for a given networking interface you, you choose, and it decides whether the packet is filtered 
or not. In that way, uh, you don't need to, to pass every single packet to user space and decide the filtering there. So it's really efficient. Uh, and just for the sake of showing an example, let's do that here. If I do this, I'm executing TCP dump. And, uh huh, I don't have a network connection, so I'm not going to be able to show you that. But, anyways, yeah, I'll do that later. So, uh, in practice, this is how it works. Um, TCP dump uses a library called libpickup, which is, works on, on Unix and also on Windows, but on Windows it doesn't use uh, BPF. It passes uh, something we call the uh, pickup filter with the syntax, which says, hey, I want uh, packets which are uh, from protocol TCP and destination port 80. libpickup compiles that expression into BPF bytecode, it's injected in the kernel, and the kernel starts applying running that virtual machine in every single packet, and based on the return value of, the, of that uh, bytecode, it will uh, f filter the packet and pass it back uh, to TCP dump. And then TCP dump will di dissect it and show it to you. And uh, actually, this, this is the, uh, let's say, the assembly language of BPF. It, it's, a, it's a limited virtual machine, but still a virtual machine. And in fact, if, if we want to, uh, they were requesting a bigger font, so let's make it bigger. Is it big enough now? Almost. Uh, is it big enough? All right. Uh, maybe you didn't know this, but if you pass the D flag to TCP dump, it will output the assembly language of the BPF filter, BPF filter which is uh, passed to the kernel. And this is it. Uh, we're not going to go through the code, but basically what this does, uh, the virtual machine uh, has different addressing modes, and it has a scratch uh, memory region, but the main memory region, if you compare it to a normal CPU model, will be mapped to the packet in every single execution of the VM. Okay. And uh, I created a couple of sample programs which do exactly uh, what that BB, uh, TCP dump execution uh, we saw, but uh, coding the BPF filter by hand so that we can see how it works. Uh, let's look, for example, at the... Uh, yeah, we're not going to look at it. <laughs> I actually have it locally, so I think I have it locally, so we can... Yes. Right. So, uh, what we have here is we're loading uh, the Ethernet header plus nine bytes, which will will give us the the protocol of the of the IP package, then we compare it against the, uh, the, pack, the type of protocol we want, which is TCP. If, we, uh, if it's TCP, we will continue checking. If not, we will go to the reject section, so on and so forth. And the same kind of program works for OS X. So, let's see. In this case, we're using a, a, a little bit more uh, sophisticated uh, addressing uh, modes, 
but it's it's basically the same filter. Actually, out of curiosity, just as an anecdote, I don't know if you can see it here, but the BM uh, has a really, really, really specialized uh, addressing mode, which is multiplying, uh, getting, getting uh, uh, one byte from the packet, getting the, the lower four bits, and multiplying it by four. Can anybody tell me uh, what's the purpose of that? Knowing what you know about IP, since everybody knew about TCP DAMP and uh, networking protocols. Any guesses? <laughs> no, let's let him answer. Yeah, maybe what? Okay, I think somebody in the first row knows the, knows the answer. Uh huh. Right. Yeah, that's the right answer. So uh, uh, a well-known field in the in the IP header. Is, is the length. And the length is expressed in number of 32-bit uh, words, right? So what this does, if you place here the offset of the, of the uh, IP length field, it will get the lower four bits. Uh, the length is expressed by four bit, bits and multiplied by four. And that will give you the length of the IP. Uh, of the IP packet, just so you know how specialized this is. This is completely specific for networking filtering. Okay, so now we know a little bit about what BPF is, how uh, maybe not knowingly you were using it uh, when filtering packets and investigating what was happening on your networking interface. But now let's talk about eBPF. EBPF stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. And uh, actually, since it was introduced, people are referring to it as BPF. And to what we saw before, the TCP dump use of it as uh, CBPF or classic BPF. Uh, EBPF comes with a much uh, richer uh, virtual machine based on 64-bit registers. It has 10 64-bit registers. In classic BPF, we only have an accumulator and an index uh, register. And thanks to that more powerful virtual machine, it's, it's easier uh, to compile and uh, to, to have a JIT just-in-time compiler from uh, uh, a normal CPU uh, code. And uh, most importantly, now, uh, nowadays in the Linux kernel, uh, we, there's no uh, normal BPF uh, virtual machine interpreter anymore. The classic BPF is transpiled, you can call it that way, to eBPF. So nowadays, even with TCP dump, you will be using uh, eBPF. Again, maybe un unknowingly. But, uh, the most important feature or features of eBPF, it's not that it has a, a more powerful virtual machine, it's that it gives us extra features apart from networking filters. Uh, one of them, which is, uh, is what I'm going to be talking about today, is dynamic tracing. Uh, and it offers other features like uh, maps and events, to make uh, to let you communicate with with your uh, eBPF program in a in a more efficient manner, lowering even farther the communication between user space and kernel space. Also, uh, it's safe in the sense that there's static analysis on your eBPF program through a, a um, kernel what they call an in kernel verifier, so that uh, your eBPF programs cannot crash the kernel. So the memory which is being accessed is monitored. Loops are not allowed, which is a, a pretty big limiting factor, but ensures that, that your kernel won't crash when it executes an eBPF program. And uh, eBPF 
apart from having a more powerful virtual machine, makes use of existing uh, kernel technologies. Uh, one of them is a KPROF, uh, which operates in a similar way as what you do with a debugger on user space. Basically, it injects some code at any point in the kernel. It replaces an instruction with a jump. Uh, it will jump to your probe, execute whatever you want to execute, inspecting things in the kernel and whatnot, restore the context, and continue execution. So before eBPF, and actually right now, because k-probes can be used independently on eBPF, uh, you typically would use them in a kernel module, for instance. You needed to work with them on kernel space. Uh, that, that means that they're unsafe in the sense that you can crash the kernel with them. And they're architecture dependent because the k-probe, the code of the k-probe needs to be, needed to be coded in whatever CPU instruction set uh, the kernel was running on. And uh, they're, they're pretty fragile because you inject a, a k-probe at a symbol plus the offset, right? And uh, different kernel versions ha will have different symbols. Data structures will be slightly different. So you need to be super careful about that. Uh, a patch or workaround to, to try to make up for that drawback is to use something called trace points, which are fixed injection points in the kernel. But that, I think that, um, goes against the flexibility of doing dynamic tracing. Uh, using trace points is basically doing st static tracing because they're fixed, right? So when using k-probes with eBPF, which allows us to do dynamic tracing, instead of uh, going on, uh, in injecting a k-probe in kernel space or on a, on a kernel module and injecting your native CPU code, which can break and crash a kernel, what we do is we inject a piece of eBPF code executed by the eBPF virtual machine. It's safe in the sense that it won't cross a kernel, assuming that the static analysis applied to that eBPF bytecode is correct. It's safe in the sense that it won't crash a kernel. Of course, it's not safe from the security perspective that maybe you will be able to reveal details about the kernel which shouldn't be uh, available to every user. And, uh, but the nice thing is that it's an architecture independent. So if you write your eBPF program uh, for, let's say, Intel 64-bit, it should run on ARM as well because it's, it's executed by a virtual machine. But unfortunately, it will still be fragile. Why? Because k-probes are k-probes. You will still inject it, inject it at a, at a kernel symbol plus an offset, which means that even if it's an eBPF uh, piece of bytecode, which is architecture independent, it very much depends on the, on the API version and uh, data structure versions. Uh, eBPF uh, comes with extra features, which are maps. We mentioned before how uh, we use BPF filters to transfer uh, uh, only the packets we're interested on from kernel to user space. So eBPF introduces something called maps, which le lets your eBPF program make a summary of what's happening on the kernel, insert it in a map. For instance, you want to have a histogram of uh, network latency and only transfer it from time to time to user space to be printed, for instance. In that way, you don't need to transfer every single event and create the, the histogram in, in user space. Uh, eBPF makes use of, of an existing kernel uh, feature, which are uh, uh, perf events, which let you uh, let your user, user space uh, program be informed about things happening in the kernel without needing to uh, do any polling. Um, uh, eBPF comes with a compiler toolkit, which is called BCC, uh, which is coded in Python. 
and it simplifies the development of, of uh, eBPF by quite a lot. And here's where the, well, I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about how we're using eBPF at, at, uh, at WIF. Uh, in WIF scope, we need to track all these connections in real time, meaning that if a process A connects to a process B, we'll represent, uh, we'll represent it through an edge. If that connection disappears, we will remove the edge. And we need to do that for any processes or containers uh, being monitored in the cluster. Uh, before eBPF, we were doing this by polling the proc file system, which is super racy and CPU uh, intensive. You need to periodically go through proc, go through proc, go through proc, and that is super, super expensive. Plus, uh, the proc file system is not made to provide you with that information. It's split across different files, so you won't read them atomically and so on. Uh, so you cannot, you cannot catch short-lived connections. You have contract, on the other hand, which will tell you about connections, but won't tell you about the PIDs of the processes being involved. So you cannot draw that graph we need to draw. We started with a BCC-based tracker, but uh, that gave us quite a bit of problems because it has runtime de uh, dependencies, it comes with an LLVM backend, and it depends on the kernel headers. And also, we have the problem of fragility with k-probes, which depends on the kernel version uh, and uh, data structures changing all the time. So how we solve this is uh, in cooperation with Kim Volk, who are organizing this conference. Uh, we created Go BPF, which are uh, Go bindings for BPF. We thought that the runtime dependency on Python, uh, a scope is coded in Go, so this was a really good fit for us. And we implemented uh, an offset guessing TCP tracker. Uh, basically, what we do is, as an initial phase on scope, we make connections to known ports in which we control. Uh, we know what the fields of the, of the socket data structure in the kernel should look like, and we evaluate what uh, information we're getting by different offsets. So we adjust dynamically to the uh, data structure of the socket in the kernel without depending on headers uh, and without depending on kernel versions. This is a bit of a, a complicated guess, but it lets us uh, be uh, version independent. And uh, this is where we stay in, in the ecosystem in terms of uh, uh, using eBPF. It's uh, much, much simpler to use, uh, but of course, of course it gives us uh, a lot less features. And uh, that was me. We have time maybe for one question, or not at all. Yeah, we... any questions? Yeah, one question. Is Go BPF a compiler? Uh, Go BPF uh, is is it invokes uh, I I believe it it invokes the the compiler. Yeah, uh, I think Alvan is here. He he knows more about it. <laughs> he can actually answer that question for you. <laughs> Okay, so you can choose whether to to use a compiler or provide the bytecode yourself. In our case, we're providing bytecode because we don't want to we don't want to depend uh, on the on the compiler at, at, at runtime. Any other questions? Okay, thank you.